you know what time it is? It's Brain Theory Time! Hello Internet, welcome back to Bane Theory. Now I know it's been over a month since part one, so putting that and the terrible design decisions I make at 3am aside, let's continue where the last video ended. And if you haven't seen part one, there's a link in the top right corner where you can go view that. And I highly recommend it because a lot of the stuff I'll be talking about in this video is directly related to the information I discussed in that video. Now, I wrote the bulk of this script almost eight weeks ago, since it was all one big script that I had to split into two videos. But the problem is that quite a bit of information has come out in regards to the law of payday, which for obvious reasons hasn't been considered. So I am very quickly going to cover some points revealed by the latest FBI file emails and this thing. First off, Beyond Yesterday, whilst their name is written in katakana and kanji, which may lead you to believe that they are Japanese, they are not. The group is covered in Sumerian and Babylonian mythology. The reason why they use Japanese characters is because they can't exactly use Suniform, which is the Sumerian writing system, so they pick a foreign language system instead. If they could use Suniform, I really think they would. So now I'm going to update this stupid logo to have a bit more relevance. Better. New information that has been uncovered since the last video reveals that Beyond Yesterday are after an item that is in possession of a United States congressman, and that it would be very difficult for even Beyond Yesterday to reach him. So we know that Beyond Yesterday lack political connections inside of Washington DC, which rules out the elephant as a potential rat, since if he was, they'd just use him to get the item, and I think it's safe to say that the item is Bane's quote unquote holy grail. We also know that Beyond Yesterday is overly cautious of revealing information to Garrett since they decided to meet him in person to be provided with more details and we know this happened because Garrett has called an urgent meeting of null description. So now we can finally shine a spotlight on the person who fits all of these descriptions. The first person that comes to mind is the Butcher. After all, she was the one trading with Locke in Alaska, and she was the only one who didn't know it was a ruse. Her introduction into the game tells us that after being impressed by our successful robbery of the diamond from the McKendrick Museum, she sends her closest confidant to meet us, Dragon, to keep the payday gang in check. We also get told that the eyes of some major crime syndicate are watching us. We also learn from her case file on the FBI site that Only Deniza, the youngest daughter, survived the massacre. She swore vengeance on the militia soldiers that killed her family and rebuilt the business. The FBI also know that Locke and the Butcher have some kind of connection, but they aren't exactly clear of what the nature of it is. Some intelligence operatives have also been following up on connections between Locke and the Butcher, though again, the exact nature of said connection remains a mystery at present. Since her closest confidant is Dragon, that means he's also a suspect. And there was a little bit of drama with Dragon acting suspicious previously. Something's up with Dragon. Something he's not telling us. But that's not all. Hey John, you should mind your own fucking business, huh? Then you have even more bizarre comments that are in Croatian. Ne mogu reći kad, ali možda kasnije, jaja. Ja. Slušaj, možda neke pčele ne vole maticu, dogovoreno. Ne brini, saznaću. Ja. Mm. Moram biti oprezan, jaja. Aha, ne znam. Nazvaću te. Yes, pepperoni and extra cheese. Dosta mi je što brinem za muriju. Kapira što ti govorim. Car je još obučen i ne znam kako izgleda. Mm. Treba nam više informacije. Da. Some bees don't like the queen bee. I will find out. I need to be careful. I have enough worrying about the cups. We need more information. Let's assume these conversations are with the butcher and are referring to Bane. Dragon is also an ex-Interpol agent that has betrayed his partner. A history of betrayal? It's not hard to imagine him doing it again. 
Being an ex-Interpol agent would also make this quote from Locke create a deeper connection. Alright, we'll probably need every little bit of cash after this, and my stash of emergency Krukerand was confiscated by Interpol, so go find that saw, yeah? We also know the Butcher will set out to eliminate anyone that interferes with her operations, as is shown in the Scarface Mansion and the assassination of Ernesto Souza. So to summarise, Bane considered the Butcher a trusted ally, she was present yet unaware of the true nature of the Alaskan deal, she owns an organisation and has sworn vengeance on militia soldiers that have killed her family. So is that it? Case closed? I don't think so. What's her personal motive for taking down Bane and the Payday Gang? We know she hates some militia soldiers. If anything, Locke would fit that description better than Bane could. Plus, she's in the gun running business. CrimeNet and the Heises are her clients, her source of income. She'd be better off attacking Gage, someone in the same business. Plus, we can't confirm if her syndicate is the same as this Beyond Yesterday, and if it were, why would she want this Holy Grail? And despite all that, if it really was her, she would know Bane is gone, see that Locke is trying to fix crime then, and would try to take him and the heists down as well. She has Dragon on the inside, she knows where the safe house is, hell, she's visited the safe house as shown in the Hoxton housewarming event, so why would Locke pay her off at the end of Brooklyn Bank? Got to pay off the butcher too, don't hold her nipping at our heels after Alaska. Locke is apologising for not keeping her in the loop, just like with the heisters. I think we can safely say that the trader isn't the butcher, but that is the only solid lead we have. She is the only trusted ally a part of the Alaskan deal who was unaware of the true nature of it. We had no accomplices, it was just the heisters, Bane, Locke and the butcher. On Reservoir Dogs Day 2, Locke is telling us the heisters what happened. I don't know about you, but I don't consider Vernon Locke a stupid character. You might have forgotten this, but he managed to hack his way into CrimeNet and basically forced his way as a contact. Guess he's a fan of that forced friendship skill. Anyway, Locke wouldn't disclose that kind of vital information if he wasn't confident that the traitor was one of the heisters. So, as I'm convinced that the Butcher is the best lead we have, someone suggests to me, well, what if it's Vlad? <laughs> no, no, of course not. Of course it's not Vlad, that crazy man. He doesn't meet our second criteria, listening in on the Alaskan deal. Hold on a moment. Dallas discusses to the crew that they are overseeing a deal between Locke and the Butcher in the safe house. This means anyone in the safe house could have been listening in. People Bane thought could be trusted. And by all chances, there's a single contractor who regularly visits the heists at the safe house. Vlad! Surely it can't be Vlad. He's our favorite, most trusted contractor, right? Well, heisters, as I was scouring the internet for clues, I stumbled across a long-forgotten video of the darkest moments in Payday history. Crime Fest 2015. The trailer for the start of the event features a six and a half minute video with some of the most eye-opening dialogue that made me convinced that the trailer is Vlad. Take a listen. A while ago, I went to the West Coast, you know, the Washington, no, not the city, the state. You know, Seattle? Yeah? Go on. You know what there is in Seattle? Yeah, a bunch of shitty grunge bands. No. The biggest crime organization in the world. You think crime net is big? These guys will steamroll all over it. <laughs> Elephant? Dentist? Ooh. No one compares to these guys. They made a deal with me, and I made a deal with them. They're gonna make me rich. I'm gonna make you rich. Huh? They need someone on the East Coast. I'm their new man. <laughs> you think it's funny? 
I will rise like a Sputnik of the East Coast. Right. Listen, I will sell safes and you will help me to find heisters who will buy them. Helping others is not really our MO. Believe me, if you try it like I did, you will understand it and you will love it. Oh man, that is crazy. Vlad not only confirms my theory that there is a bigger organization than CrimeNet, he says that they will steamroll all over CrimeNet. Even better, we learn that this organization is based in Washington, Seattle, the West Coast, and that they made Vlad their man on the East Coast. Now, if we go to the start of the video, we also have this. Oh, look who fucking made it here. Oh, changing his friends. Didn't I tell you, huh? Huh? I told you it would rule that fucking East Coast. Look! Look around you, huh? Mm, beautiful fucking weapons. <laughs> I spit at Elephant and the dentist. Boom! <laughs> Cuzzly Dolvin here. <laughs> they chose Vlad. Vlad and Vlad only. The biggest criminal organization sure did the right choice. <laughs> you are very lucky. I always like you crazy bastards <laughs> and, and your weird masks. I believe you are the right people for me. I'm giving you the same offer again. Work with me and you'll be filthy rich. This, my friends, is the birth of a new era. Vlad is ambitious. We know that. He contracts us to steal goddamn nukes for him. Even the FBI file's description says that he deals in high stakes jobs. What higher stake is there than betraying the Payday Gang and removing Bane from power? But look, I know what some of you are gonna say in the comments. Wait, wait. Beyond yesterday are Jews? Fuck! Not that. But Kenny, Vlad is merely referencing Valve, since Overkill introduced a steam economy and had to go through Valve. Hell, even the microsite copies that of the CSGO arms deal update. And to that I say, yes, I know. It still doesn't make what Vlad said any less valid as a point of evidence. Someone at Overkill wrote those dialogue lines. So could Vlad really betray the Payday Gang? Well, quite honestly, yes. Let's go back one more time to that trailer and see a bit earlier in the conversation. Change, right? Change. Change, that's right. Change. All right, I got a few more miles. Hey, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, wait. Listen, I have some special news for you. Vlad clearly doesn't care. Failing to remember or even pronounce Chains' alias, he can't be that fond of us. But does Vlad really think he can take us down? Well, I found a pretty revealing piece about Vlad's history in the most unlikely of places. The very first legendary weapon skin, Vlad's Rodina, tells the history of the gun. It starts off as a gun with the mind of its own being passed through the army and ending up in the Russian mob. It reads, Shortly after, Rodina found its way into the hands of the Russian mob, running cigarettes and booze between Rostov and Donetsk. Though known to the police as a minor outfit, not particularly ambitious, this mob began to grow. It expanded with extreme aggression, got involved in drugs and murder, and quickly the mobs around it began turning up dead. The limited video footage supported the notion that most deaths were due to a single army issue AK. Its wielder, who had been believed to be a low-ranking enforcer, began to climb ranks. But don't think of climbing a ladder, rather he climbed a mountain of corpses. This ambitious fuck was later identified as Vladimir Kazak. Man, not only does that tell us a ton about Vlad, it also shows he's killed entire mobs before, basically on his own. Vlad not only has the connections of a larger organization to take us down, he could easily stand on his own to take us down. And isn't it odd that all year we haven't had a single Vlad heist? Usually our Christmas heists are all about him. White Xmas, Stealing Xmas and Santa's Workshop. What if 
Brooklyn Bank was in some way connected to Vlad. So Vlad is not only a trusted friend of Bane, he was listening in on the Alaskan deal, he has direct relations to the largest criminal organization in the world, and he has the best motive and history of anyone that would want to take down Bane. Not to mention, he already has a character model. So, can you tell me who Bane really is? Come on, you must know something. Where is he? Does he have an office or something? And the only other contractor that has one is, well, you know... So with all that information, let's piece together the series of events leading up to the disappearance of Bane. It begins with the Seattle-based crime syndicate we now know as Kataru. Oh, that's right. Beyond Yesterday is now called Kataru, thanks to the latest puzzle from THIS THING! Watching our growth as an organization and eliminating the heads of surrounding organizations, they start becoming more wary of us. However, since CrimeNet is on the other side of the country, and the fact they have to deal with the DHS and 4C, CrimeNet is ignored. Kataru start to expand their gun running business in the form of weapon skins to the east coast. They choose Vlad, an ambitious Russian who seeks riches and high stakes jobs to front their operations in the east. CrimeNet start to expand operations, having known to hit places in Las Vegas, Florida, and Russia. Kataru start getting worried, but they know they have an inside man who can help keep track of CrimeNet's movements. Vernon Locke intercepts a message and discovers someone, most likely Kataru, is out to destroy the Payday Gang. He learns that an agent of these people, Matt Roscoe, is meeting someone in downtown New York. This would be the new traitor, Vlad. Bane finally learns some information on this holy grail, an incredibly rare item. However, acquiring it isn't as straightforward as just taking it. It is possible that multiple smaller parts are required, such as the medallion from the Brooklyn Bank. A part of this holy grail puzzle is in the possession of a United States congressman in Washington DC, the elephant. Kataru learning about the holy grail concludes that it is theirs. They have started a plan to destroy CrimeNet and get information from Bane about the Holy Grail. The only problem is, they cannot locate Bane. Bane informs Locke of this Holy Grail, but won't mention exactly what it is. He mentions that other syndicates, mainly Kataru, are interested in it also, and is worried that heisters won't be able to defend themselves should Kataru launch an offensive in Washington DC. Kataru being a syndicate much larger than CrimeNet, have connections inside governments, the FBI, the DHS, GenSec, and especially Murky Water. Locke, monitoring Murky Water communications, learns that Kataru is planning on using Murky Water to raid Bane's headquarters, since they have a vested interest in CrimeNet being destroyed. Locke, in attempts to help the heisters, tricks them into going to Alaska, as not to alert the new trader in the safe house. Vlad, overhearing Dallas explaining they have to oversee a deal between Locke and the Butcher in Alaska, tells Kataru that now is the time to strike. Bane will be at his most vulnerable since he won't have the heist as protection, and they can potentially interfere with a heist and gather information on Bane's location. Kataru then learned that Bane is teaming up with the Cabot's crew as a favor and hitting a jewelry boutique in Los Angeles. Kataru sent a message to Solomon Garrett asking, what is stopping your nemesis worth to you? A day or two later, Kataru install malware and viruses onto the jewelry store's networks, which, when accessed by Bane, will reveal his location in Washington, D.C. Halfway there, some weird traffic coming across the network. Strange blockers on the network. Almost done, though. This isn't right. Not even the feds do this kind of crap. They then inform the police that the store will be robbed by the Payday Gang, and the police set up an ambush. They also inform Murky Water that they will soon have Bane's location in Washington DC, and that they should be ready to mobilize at any moment. Bane falls for the trap, and his location is compromised. Locke only just manages to intercept the messages revealing Bane's headquarters is about to be hit by Murky Water, and manages to successfully get in contact with the Payday Gang and direct them to safety. However, Kataru keeps tabs on them whilst following Mr. Pink. I swear I was being followed for a while, and not by cops either. Having captured Bane, but failing to have the heisters meet their demise at the hands of the cops, and the unexpected return of Murky Water Operator Locke aiding their escape, Kataru used their connections inside Murky Water to oust him. With Locke's help, we're able to retrieve a part of the Holy Grail puzzle Bane had just discovered, the Brooklyn Bank Medallion. 
as well as getting some funds for him to set up a new command center for CrimeNet and pay off the butcher for keeping her in the dark. And there you have it folks, was it worth the wait? Did I manage to convince you that Vlad will be revealed to be the traitor? Or are you still hoping it's the butcher? Or someone else entirely? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I originally planned to end this video with saying that the next event will reveal everything, but I don't believe that anymore since support for Payday 2 has been extended to 2019 and is acting as a bridge to Payday 3. There is literally no end in sight for Payday's narrative. We can only hope that there is a Spring Break 2018 to reveal more information, but if past events are any indications, we won't have a Spring Break since that only seems to happen every second year, so we might have to wait until Crime Fest 2018 or Spring Break 2019. And where the fuck is Kento? Hey, that's just the 